Hey, everybody. Happy Sunday. It's good to be back. Last week sucked. Um, well, I mean, this week didn't. This week went much better. <laughs> um, I did not have bourbon talk last week. And uh, for those of you who follow what I'm doing or what I talk about or whatever, um, a friend of mine died. Um, I just want to take a second to talk about him and uh, before we get into uh, all this jackassery. But uh, so my friend, uh, his name is Andy, and he was 37 years old, way too young, had a wife and a little two-year-old. Uh, he was awesome. Andy was great. And he was really, really good dude, uh, kind, thoughtful, smart, but um, just, just level-headed and patient as they come. Incredible guy. Uh, it was a huge loss, and it uh, came completely out of nowhere. Really, really awful. But, um, you know, before we get going with tonight, I just want to say that uh, he's going to be missed. He will not be forgotten. Uh, really good political guy. He, he believed in equality and justice and trying to make the world a better place. He was really politically active, politically savvy, but also kind. And I learned a lot from him. And I think I and everyone else would be a whole lot better if we were more like him. So I just want to say before we get going, I am sorry I missed you last week, but this is for Andy. Cheers. That being said, I missed everybody. <clears throat> last week i'm just doing this thing i'm i'm ready to go I'm ready to uh ready to kill this thing today um luckily there is no shortage of things to talk about uh, we're sitting here the day after fascistic street gangs roamed washington dc beating people stabbing people assaulting people we're going to talk about that but it is um It sucks. The whole thing sucks. That's the only way to say it that, that is even close to being true and real, which is that it sucks. The whole thing sucks. Um, you know, I've been trying to tell people that this fight was not going to end in November on election night or the Saturday that Biden was declared the winner. Uh, this is indicative of a larger problem that we're going to be dealing with for a while. That's the first step in all of this is recognizing that it's not just going to stop and everything isn't just fine and that we have we have an uphill climb. We have a lot of things to do. But I have to tell you right now, before we even move a step forward, I think we can do it. I think we're going to do it. But we have to get serious about it. We have to recognize what has happened. We have to recognize what is growing in this country and where Trumpism came from, what Trumpism is, and what we're up against, and what we need to do. I'm going to be spending more time in these bourbon talks and in the Muckrake podcast talking about prescriptive behaviors, things that we can do as citizens and individuals, what we can do on a larger scale in terms of uh, the political system as a culture, but we really need to start doing that. I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about uh, the Lincoln Project and AOC tonight. That's one of the questions I've got, so I'm going to get to that, Panther. But um, yeah, we we've 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 done a good job. We've done a good job of diagnosing this thing. And for those of you who, and by the way, before we even move a step further, I am. Uh, Incredibly grateful for you all. I know I say that all the time, but I want to I want to reiterate. I'm very grateful for you for coming and hanging out with me on Sundays. Um, losing my friend made me very cognizant of making sure that the people who mean something to me that I let them know what they mean to me, and I don't want to take any chances. 
you know, that somebody might die suddenly or something bad might happen and I won't get the chance to tell people. So first and foremost, you mean a lot to me. But before we get into these questions, I think it's important to touch back on something that I've talked about a lot in these, which is we've diagnosed this stuff. We've recognized it. We've talked about what it is. We've started to gain a collective understanding of how we've reached this moment. And I've seen it, I've seen it like both in conversations I've had with people outside of these talks, conversations I've had online, conversations I've had on podcasts, conversations I've just had. Like we're starting to we're starting to come to an actual grip on what this thing is. And that's the first step is we have to get educated about what this is. And we're starting to have a conversation about it. And I've noticed it in the questions too, is that we're starting to gain a common understanding. And that's important because when this Trump thing started, I don't know how it was for you, but it was this way for me. I was going to Trump rallies and I was like leaving them and I was trying to tell everyone who would listen to me. I was like, something bad is going on here. I don't know what it is yet, but it's awful. And it's really, really dangerous. And then meanwhile, I was met with like people saying I was being alarmist or, you know, unreasonable or whatever. I've noticed this has changed. And through things like this bourbon talk, through the podcast, through, and it's not just the Muckrake podcast, it's other podcasts too. It's other other people who talk about this stuff and study this stuff. Kinsier, Ali, all, all these people, Stanley, these people who like take this stuff seriously and are paying attention to it. I'm noticing that we're starting to coalesce. Like there's these people over here who don't take it seriously. They think this whole thing's a game. They think it's a sport. They think that it's hilarious. They think that Trumpism is funny. They think that things like the Proud Boys are funny. They think it's all going to go away and the system is going to preserve itself. But I want to point out, and I want you to start noticing this because it's one of the things that keeps me going. Whether it's in the chat of this talk or again, the muckrake community over on, on, on Patreon, like I'm starting to notice that people are making connections themselves. They're talking to one another. They're there for each other. This is the community stuff that I've talked about because this fascism seeks to divide us. It makes us feel like we're completely alone and we will never have power again. And so we should just either give up all hope or it should just become an ironic joke. Being guy at Chalupa, absolutely. I agree, Steve. But what we're building is a community of mutual understanding. I've seen people take care of each other. I've seen people be kind to one another. I've seen people start to support each other. That's the infrastructure that we have to start realizing and start building. That's important. That's important because fascism erupts from alienation and, and division. This is a big, giant thing that we have to do. We have to build these communities. Yeah, I, Wells, you, you as well. The conversation I had with you, I, when we started talking on your podcast, I was just like, this is a guy who gets it. And these are important things. When you find the people who get it and they recognize reality and they're not afraid to put their lives and their careers on the line, that's an important thing. I talked about this in another live stream. I started noticing that when I called out fascism and talked about the danger we were in, the publishing opportunities went away. All of a sudden, the New York Times wasn't talking to me about columns anymore. We need people who aren't afraid to lose their careers and their reputations because they call the danger out for what it is. All right. And everybody who's hanging out here on a Sunday night, coming out on a Sunday night and just talking about this stuff and being honest about this stuff, this is important. Because in a fascistic movement, in an authoritarian situation, they divide us. They make you question reality. This is important. This is hugely important. And now we have to start talking about, and I mentioned this uh, a few months ago. I started talking about this. I asked you to start thinking about what do you want the world to look like? It's not enough to be Trump. It's not enough to beat back fascism, although those are absolutely crucial and necessary. What do you want the world to look like? What do you want? What do you want to happen? What do you want lives to feel like? And this is hugely important because I have to tell you, and, and, and I hope that this comes through. Gesson's another one. Absolutely. This is important. 
we're at a we're at a crux here. We're at a crossroads. We're at a precipice. There are these moments where the order gets troubled, and it starts moving into crisis. And as it moves into crisis, all of a sudden, everybody who thought that nothing could ever change, all of a sudden, they're like, oh, my God, I never could have imagined this crisis could have come. What could we ever possibly ever do? The people who make that answer are fascists or authoritarians. They're the ones who try and recognize when those moments, those crossroads are. We have to beat them to it. They have an alternate view of how the future looks. They have a plan. They have come together and they, they are together because that hatred unites them. We have, to, we have to come up with something different. We have to come up with an alternative future vision because this system, as it's set up right now, it's about done. It's about done. The economy doesn't work. The politics don't work. The society doesn't work. We either start coming up with our own different version. The end of history was the biggest bullshit thing. Absolutely, Claire. Francis Fukuyama, if you guys haven't read this, this is, a, this is a good little piece of homework. If you haven't had a chance sometime, go and look up the essay, The End of History by Francis Fukuyama, who, by the way, was one of those neoconservative assholes like the Cheneys and the Wolfowitz, the Rumsfelds. And he said, oh, we defeated the Soviet Union. The future is just going to be flat. It's going to be an American future, and everyone will just... Uh, you know, they'll buy blue jeans and rock and roll CDs and they'll be the end of it. That's where we're going. And they were wrong. They were dead, dead wrong. History doesn't stop, stop for anybody. And actually, I've been doing all this research and I find that everybody thinks history just stops and nothing changes. And it always changes. We're at a moment of change. We have to start coming up with the alternative vision to these assholes who are in Washington, D.C., beating people and stabbing people and talking about overthrowing elections. We have to supply an alternative to that. Because if we don't, they'll get it. They'll get it. We have to start coming up with a difference. Oh, did we really defeat the Soviet Union? We outlasted the Soviet Union. It's like, uh, I don't know if anybody has ever seen this. Um, the old Superman comic book where he fights Doomsday and dies for a little bit. There's this moment where they punch each other at the same time and then they just die. It just so happens the Soviet Union died before we did. We dealt each other mortal blows and we've been bleeding out for a long time. Long time. We have to figure out something different. We have to figure out some sort of new path. And and that's what I we, we need to talk about. And I have to tell you, I wasn't going to talk about this tonight, but it's as good a time as any. You know, when I started the Muckrake podcast, when I started doing these bourbon talks, I didn't, I was, I was more interested in getting word out about what was going on. And I still had that old mindset, that old journalism mindset that I was going to report it and let people make their own conclusions or whatever. I still want to do that, but I have thoughts about how to make this country better. I have thoughts about how we can turn the tide. I have thoughts about how we can beat fascism and we can make a better future. I'm, I'm going to start sharing them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start act, like becoming an activist for a better future. It's not enough to report on it. It's not enough to, to, to sort of diagnose it and talk about it. I'm going to start talking about what I think we can do different. Yeah, we're going to talk about yesterday in D.C. Absolutely. So I, um, you know, just bring a full circle. That's what Andy would have done. That's what Andy was about. He was about finding solutions. He was about fighting for it. So I am uh, throwing my hat in the ring on that one. I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm done sitting back and trying to pick my spots and talk about what I want to do. I want to diagnose what's happening. I want to educate people about what's happening. And I want to start talking about what in the hell we can do. Cause I, I, I don't want to watch. I don't, I don't, I don't want to look back. Hopefully knock on wood. I don't want to look back on my life and, and realize there was an opportunity to make some sort of a difference in that regard. I've talked about it. I said, you got to get educated, you got to get pissed off, and you have to get organized. And we're, we need to do all three. So I'm, I'm, I'm in on this thing. Cheers. All right, let's get into the uh, subject at hand. <sighs> Rich Rant says, do you think the violence in D.C. last night is a preview of what to come? Yeah, I do. 
Um, I do, I do think it's a preview. You know, one of the things that we do is when we talk about fascism, we kind of do this thing where it sort of exists in the moment where they take power. Um, you know, when you see these documentaries about like Nazi Germany or they don't really talk about, um, fascist Italy very much. And the reason they don't talk about it very much is because there is a lot of, there's a lot to deal with there because there were so many different programs and the way the fascist Italy sort of reached out to people, it makes us uncomfortable. But with Nazi Germany, we basically start with Hitler, you know, making these big speeches and torch lit arenas and doing all this stuff. We don't talk about how they came about. The Nazis were initially a street gang and they were just a bunch of thugs like absolutely absurd thugs who went around beating up leftists and everybody's just like, ah, the Nazis are a bunch of assholes. That's just how it works. Here's the problem. The problem is that fascist street gangs like the proud boys make excellent weapons. So the reason that the Nazis took over Germany is not because they just convinced everybody it's because you had a bunch of capitalists and media members who saw the Nazis as an opportunity. And they were like, okay, so we have a growing social justice, socialism, leftist movement growing in Germany. Okay. Those people would be out in the streets protesting, trying to bring down the, the capitalist system as it waned. Well, what ends up happening, and this is what happens with fascism. Capitalist, use Nazis to put down leftist. They're the they're jackbooted thugs in the streets. They go out and they make sure that the leftists are afraid to protest. They make sure that the leftists are afraid to participate in the, the political body. So the capitalists throw a bunch of money at the fascists because they're useful, right? And you have all these media barons, by the way, if that doesn't strike a chord with you, I don't know what is. All these media barons in Germany are like, ah, this Hitler guy, he'll be very useful. We'll be able to control him. We'll put him out there. He'll be a puppet. He'll make sure that everything's fine. Fascists are a weapon until they take over the people who have been using them as a weapon. Fascists are used to square the circle of capitalism. Capitalism is inherently unstable, especially the type of capitalism that we're talking about, you know, with banks collapsing and stock markets crashing. So what happens? You have a bunch of thugs who go out and beat up people who say it should be different. And that's what's happening right now. It may not be the Proud Boys. It may not be the KKK. It may not be neo-Nazis. I don't know who it might be. But what we're watching right now is that our, our situation is completely ripe for street gangs to get out and, 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 and beat the hell out of people and stab people. We had shootings all around the nation last night, people running around with semi-automatic weapons, all right? We're in the precursor. We're in the lead up. Donald Trump was not the end point. Donald Trump, again, and I keep saying this, Donald Trump was like the velociraptor in Jurassic Park who just found weaknesses in the fence. What comes now, particularly as our economy is about to collapse, as our political structure gets worse, as inequalities get worse, and by the way, as global climate change starts to rear its ugly head, these fascists are going to become very useful. We need to recognize that. That's who they are. That's who they are. But absolutely. this I mean, we you saw it before the election. You had militias breaking into legislatures and interrupting business. They couldn't even hold their legislative process because they had people in their semi-automatic weapons. Yeah, it's absolutely a precursor to what's coming in the future. And we got to talk about that. We got to talk about how to de-radicalize it, how to cut it off at the kneecaps, and what we need to do different. These are absolutely things that we have to do, which we're going to talk about. <clears throat> Sister of Perpetual Anxiety, would love to hear thoughts on what these ding-dongs are up to, the Proud Boys. First of all, ding-dongs. Underrated personal insult. Very Midwestern. I like it. I like that. That's a. It seems innocent, but it also just nails them. What are they up to? They don't have anything better to do. That's the long and the short of it. 
they're radicalized. They don't have much skin in the game. Most of them probably don't have jobs. Most of them probably don't have careers. They hang out with a bunch of guys. They feel stronger. They feel like they're badasses simply because it's the same thing as the Nazis. You put an um, uh, armband on and suddenly you're a tough guy. It's masculine insecurity coming out on the, on the national stage. It's awful. Lee says, what's the most important thing Biden can do to cripple domestic terrorist groups like the Proud Boys? Crush them. Make that one of the we'll make that one of the main priorities of your Department of Justice and FBI. We've been told for decades now that white supremacists are one of the main threats in America. It's worse than Muslims. It's 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 worse than anything else. It's white people. It's white separatists, white terrorists. Take advantage of that. Get in there. Mess them up. Go on the inside. And by the way, the, the power and leverage of the United States government has always been used against leftists. It's infiltrating, you know, socialist groups. It's going into, uh, you know, communist groups. It's going into student groups or NAACP groups or Black Panther groups. No, those aren't the dangers. The dangers are white terrorists who, by the way, if we are not careful, Oklahoma City is going to look like it is just small potatoes compared to what these people are going to try and do. So no, you crush them. You go in and you make that one of your priorities because this is a giant problem, massive problem. So I think you have to do a couple of things and I'll get into this a little bit more, but I'll go ahead and give you a, a, um, an appetizer on this. I think you crush them via law enforcement and you make sure that you keep them from attacking because these people, I have to tell you on January 20th, these people are at war with the government. They're not at war with the government right now. There's a weird sort of mental gymnastic that they're trying to have to do. They support Donald Trump, but they're against the government. The deep state helped them do that. This is one of those situations where you have to, you have to curb away any threat that these groups might cause, while also making sure that other people aren't radicalized. You have to do massive stimulus. You have to do massive projects that make sure that people who don't have jobs and don't have directions in their lives, that they have jobs and they have directions. Same thing FDR did after the Great Depression. You take a bunch of people who might join a fascist organization, you have them go across the country and work on a park or a bridge or some sort of infrastructure, and you keep the fascists from gaining recruits. Sebastian Lima, why is this coup even continuing? Uh, how many more times does Trump have to be rejected? Number two, why are so many people who hate masks and lockdowns now traveling to countries like Mexico and Puerto Rico? Number two, they don't care. They're doing whatever they want to do, period. Uh, number one, why is the coup continuing? It's like I was talking about in my live stream. I, God, a couple of weeks ago? I, I, who, what is time? I don't have a clue. There's a financial incentive for the coup to continue. Donald Trump knows why he, he knows he lost. He knows he lost. The Republicans know Donald Trump lost. The grifters underneath Donald Trump know that he lost. But it's just a big scam. They all need it. Donald Trump, to earn as much money as possible, needs to pretend like the election was stolen from him. Republicans need to pretend like the election was stolen from him so they can maintain their support among the Trump cultists and also, it means more money that they can fundraise and possibly win, like the special election and probably the midterms of 2022. Oh, I'm going to get that in a second, Violet. Then all the people under Trump, their careers have to continue. And you either say, we were wrong, we don't have a majority, and that's where we are, or you say the election was stolen, you are the majority, you're in trouble. And by the way, that means more ratings, more fundraising, all that. It's a giant scam. The whole point is that all of them know it's a scam. They all know Trump lost the election, but they need to pretend like they think that he didn't. If, if somehow or another, and by the way, Steve, I'm glad you brought that up about attorneys. We'll talk about that in a second. If the election is somehow or another overturned, I don't think it will be. I think we're, I think we're done with that. We might have other problems, which we'll talk about in a minute. But if somehow or another, this fiction that they've created, this alternate reality where the election was stolen in a coup, if somehow or another they managed to overturn the election, well, so be it. They're ready to do that too. Donald Trump really didn't want to be president of the United States in 2016. 
It was a way to inflate his brand. But then they were like, oh, shit, I guess we got to go with this. They're more than fine destroyed democracy and our electoral system and America as we know it as a means of making more money and gaining more power. Because they don't care about us. They don't care about these systems. These things are negligible. They've been crying out against postmodernism for forever, but they believe in it. They're nihilists when it comes to this stuff. They don't actually believe in the sanctity of this stuff. They'll make more money if they're able to destroy it. It's a weird situation. Now, Steve says, as an attorney, I strongly feel that the courts should start sanctioning attorneys. This is one of those weird things about the law. The law is the border between different realities. This is how I feel. This is how you feel. The law is the line in between. The problem is lawyers can go out and they can put in a suit that they want and sort of contend the reality and they can end up losing it. And in a way, with somebody like a Sydney Powell, Sydney Powell is now creating for herself a massive financial windfall because she's one of the good lawyers who tried to stop the steal or whatever. It's all screwed up. And one of the terrible things, and this scared the living shit out of me when I realized it. This was a frightening thing. And when I learned this in college, I sort of I sort of sat with it for a while and it just really made me uncomfortable and I wasn't sure why. And I, I don't think I was able to put my fingers on it until the last couple of years. Everything that we're talking about, laws, politics, elections, countries, society, they're all constructs. We just made them up. They're only as real as our ability to maintain them or, or have a consensus for them. We've been acting on gentlemen's or gentlewomen's agreements for so long. And, and we've just been like, well, everyone will be fine. It'll work out. You know, people mean well. And now we have a guy who doesn't mean well. And that's what it gets us. Yeah, abstractions. That's all. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. The idea that all this stuff is just social constructs, whew, that kept me up for nights, nights, because I grew up in this very religious, strict, stringent background. And when all of a sudden I realized that all this stuff was just made up and enforced via like loosely defined social carrots and sticks, whew, terrifying. And that's the thing. Kelly says it's only reality as long as we all agree to it. Or until the powerful punish us into believing it. Or if we don't agree to go ahead and go along with it, they can disappear us, which is fascism. It's where they take their version of reality and doesn't matter how many people believe in it, they either talk you into it for economic incentive, they intimidate you until you shut up about it, or if those things don't work, they'll kill you. You're done. That's it. We talked about this over and over and over again. We talked about things like QAnon and everyone's like, oh my God, QAnon is such bullshit. It's total bullshit. It can be made real. If we're not careful tomorrow, like, you know, it's like this thing where it's like, they're going to arrest Obama. They're going to arrest Clinton. And everyone's like, yeah, all right, good luck. They could. Why wouldn't they? I mean, I mean, you know, you can make that happen. Those are things you can make happen. So even the QAnon fantasy, which is just fever dream bullshit, that could come real. That could just become real. Trumpism could become real. And if you want to go ahead and say something about it, the entire authority and power and force of the state comes down on you. I'm reading right now. Um, I just wrote the second chapter of the new book. Uh, and it's um, uh, the Middle Ages. Thinking about the Middle Ages and how that whole thing works. And it's just like, you know, the church would send around inquisitors to every town and they would just be like, I've heard you've been saying things. I think you're in league with the devil. Now you're on a rack. Now you're being tortured. Now you're being murdered. They do whatever they want. If they have enough power and no one's there to, uh, no one's there to stop them, they make reality what they want it to be. So once you start realizing that, this shit gets a little bit worse. It's bad. It's bad. Doesn't mean that. Doesn't mean that there's no hope. There is actually hope. I think we're going to be okay. And I have, I have thoughts on that that I'm going to talk about tonight. But I, I, think we're, I think we're going to be okay. But that doesn't mean that we can just be like, ah, it's over. We're done. Sharp tooth. Will the Republicans destroy themselves and save us the trouble The destroy the GOP chance or something? They absolutely are something. 
Um, this is one of those things that we've been studying for a while. I forgot I had bourbon here. We've been studying for a while, which is, I think the essential moment to remember was the first Republican GOP primary debate in Cleveland. I want to say it was in August. I was there in, in Cleveland. No one had any idea who the hell I was. It's weird to think back on that time. So at this debate in Cleveland where Trump, um, he gets challenged by Megyn Kelly. And Megyn Kelly, you know, calls out Trump for being a misogynist. And Trump just goes right back after her. And then, of course, the next day he says to her, um, or he says on some radio show she had blood coming out of her wherever, claiming she was, you know, being an asshole to him because she was menstruating or whatever. Um, at that moment, Trump took what you would call orthodoxy, which is another thing I've been thinking a lot about because I've been writing this new book. He took the orthodoxy of the right and made it his own. In the past, it was Fox News. And you had Fox News at the top and then all the Republicans underneath it. And they just followed whatever Fox News said. At that point, Trump said, no, Fox News is bullshit unless I say it's not bullshit. And then all of a sudden, it was Trump over Fox News and then all the Republicans underneath him. So now Fox News has to follow whatever Trump does or they hemorrhage millions of viewers. Now, do I think that the Republican Party is going to ruin itself? No. The Republican Party, like it did in 2010 with the Tea Party, is going to see Trumpism as a major threat to break away, form its own party, possibly destabilize the party. They will go ahead and absorb it and turn it into their own. I keep saying this. The Republican Party is going to turn into a Trumpist QAnon party, and it's going to happen real fast. And we've already got markers of it. Down here, Carol Kelly Loeffler, who, by the way, is just the worst politician. She sucks. Oh, God, does she suck. But, you know, it's like one of these things where you have like a rich, wealthy person and they put on a dumb jacket and they grab a semi-automatic weapon. They're like, nobody's going to take my guns. And it's like, well, do, which, which major mansion do you keep those at? Right? So you already have the Republican Party starting to absorb Trumpism and QAnon and all that shit and bring it into their own. They're not going to shy away from it. That's just not going to happen. In the next four years, we're going to see somebody come along and try and pick up what Trump left behind. You're not going to see them moving away. That's just not going to happen. Lewis all. Why are white supremacist groups... By the way, real fast. You know what? In the past, I just would have moved ahead. I just would have moved ahead, but I'm not going to do that. Actually, here's how you do it. Here's how you... It's in the old um, Mortal Kombat games. The fatality. How do you get rid of the Republican Party? Because the Republican Party is actually in danger right now. So here's what you do. You start actually appealing to the economic conditions of the people who vote and support for Trump without talking about the QAnon bullshit and the white supremacy bullshit and all of that. I'm talking about the people that I've grown up with, the people in my family, stuff like that. I think that you make a giant movement, again, like the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, or some sort of stimulus package to push uh, sustainable energy or, um, you know, something to fight climate change. And you just flood middle America with a bunch of money to reopen factories that create, I don't know, solar panels, windmills, whatever you want to create, whatever direction you want to take this in. You flood middle America with it. You lower the temperature and then you take away the Republican base of working people. Now, doesn't mean they're not going to be racist. Doesn't mean they're not going to be fascistic. But I tell you what, I keep saying this. If you get them jobs working towards global climate change, if you do that, they'll believe in climate change. And they'll start going that way. Because these people, the people in my family, the people I've grown up with, my neighbors, all these people I care about, they were FDR Democrats. Why? Because FDR helped them. Then later on, they were for Reagan. They were totally fine for Reagan. They were for Bill Clinton until all of a sudden you started messing around with NAFTA and free trade. And then they went away and they became free game for the Republican Party. So you cut out the Republican Party at the knees. And all of a sudden, they're not able to bring in that Trumpist support. They're still the Trumpists. You're not going to get rid of all of them. That's not going to happen. But all of a sudden, the Republican Party is at a point where they can't even win a senatorial campaign anymore. That's the moment where they'll start backing away from the ledge. That's how you do it. 
That's how you beat the Republican Party. If anybody wants to talk about it, anybody wants to talk about the rhetoric of it, they want to talk about how to communicate these people, my DMs are open. I'm happy to help people out because you can destroy this. You can get rid of this fascistic movement. You just have to change the way you think about politics. It's just true. No, NAFTA, NAFTA was actually conjured up by, um, by Reagan and the Heritage Foundation, all of those people. He brought it up, I want to say, in 76 or 78. I could be wrong. It's one or the other, 76 or 78. He pushed as president. George H.W. Bush moved it. And then Clinton was the one who passed it after he beat George H.W. Bush. And he passed it with, um, with the support of the Republicans and not the Democrats. But it's always been pushed on Clinton. It actually wasn't. It was started out by Ronald Reagan which, by the way, kind of screwed it. And Clinton did push NAFTA. And that's because the Democratic Party post-Reagan believed that they couldn't beat Reaganism and they had to push Reaganism. The Democratic Party moved right. It's got to move left again. It's got to move left and around. I'm sorry, but it does. Lewis Hall, why are white supremacist groups rarely held accountable? It's right there in the question. They're white. To have a conversation about white supremacists, white terrorists, you have to have a conversation about white supremacy. Nobody wants to have that conversation. That's why you have a lot of these people who are like, you know, you'll have one of these people walk into a Walmart or a Kmart and shoot a bunch of people and leave behind a manifesto. No one talks about what they said. No one talked about what they think. Why? Because white supremacy is the third rail of American politics, man. Nobody wants to talk about that stuff. That's not great on the cable news. That's not great on the nightly news. Not good. Doesn't feel good. White supremacy makes white people feel bad. It's true. That's why they're not being harassed. That's why they can run over cops, you know, as they fly like American flags or whatever. It's white supremacy. Period. Wear a mask. Are you satisfied with what the Supreme Court did, or do you think they should have written more? As a lawyer, I'm satisfied because what they did should prevent this in the future. So I'm glad to ask the question about the Supreme Court decision to get rid of this bullshit uh, Texas thing. First and foremost, shouldn't have got to that point. That Texas said that and talked about secession. And you have 100 plus Republicans who joined in on it and multiple states who jumped in on it. I should tell you that there's a massive problem and economic and political incentive to push this bullshit. Now, I tried to talk about this on Twitter the other day. Tweets are hard. They're hard to get into context. That's why I do this whole bourbon talk. The Supreme Court has a problem. The Supreme Court currently has a right wing majority, a conservative majority that was gotten through ill-gotten means, right? At least two of these people should not be on there. It should be a different court. The problem is that the court does not reflect the will of the people. They have an outsized conservative representation on the court when, oh my God, what is it? Okay, so you got Trump and George W. Bush. So going back to 92, you have two Republicans who have won president of the United States of America? Two? 28 years? There's no reason why they should control the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court and the justices know this because all of them, all if you are on the Supreme Court, you're worried about legacy. You're worried about what scholars are going to be saying about you at long after your death. Because that's all you've done. You study all these Supreme Court justices and what they said here and what their writings were like and how they're considered and how history views them. So they're trying really hard to maintain a semblance of respectability. Also, if they're going to do things, and, and by the way, I do not think they're going to get rid of Roe v. Wade. I think that is always the windmill that the Republican Party always talks about doing and it, it raises a bunch of money. It gets a lot of people pissed off. Republicans and the conservatives who are on this court, I think they understand that the, the violence in the streets and the uproar would be incredible. I, 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 they might. And by the way, I could be wrong on that. I knock on wood again. And I'm wrong about that, that they don't go after Roe v. Wade. But they, worried about, they worry about that stuff. They really do. But they also need to maintain the quote-unquote appearance of integrity of the court. Because the court, I mean, it's just an institution. It's a social construction. They don't want to be seen as being overly biased or overly political or whatever. We're so damn lucky that this wasn't a Florida in 2000 situation. 
but it wasn't just one state. The problem here is that Trump lost so like overwhelmingly and in so many different places in different ways that the court couldn't have done anything. The Supreme Court and the Republican Party both recognized that Trump lost and that there's not a reason to give political capital in this thing. They've already been seated on the court, so those justices don't care about Trump. The Republican Party doesn't like Trump. He's actually a liability. So they don't want to spend a lot of political capital. They'll make, you know, the illusion of supporting Trump, but that's it. So the the court did the right thing, of course, by getting rid of this bullshit um, brief. I wish they would have written more because it, it leaves open a lot of opportunity in the past. I mean, in the future, it leaves open a lot of opportunity in the future. Uh, and I do not trust this court. I don't. I mean, Coney Barrett and Kavanaugh, they suck, man. They just absolutely suck. Oh, it was all the the arguments are all bad, all bad. Wobblies, how do we fix a system this completely fractured? Great question. Russians just hacked the treasury and no government official has anything to say about it. Okay, this hack. Um, no idea. No idea. No idea what's going on with this hack. But I mean, you know, we're being hacked. I mean, that's the way it works. Probably an inside job. The Trump administration has made sure to leave the back door open for Russia in literally everything. Just by doing nothing. They have allowed Trump so much room, so much room to do whatever they want. Um, how do we repair the country? I think the answer to that is that we pull back a little bit. First things first. It's this state of artificial austerity that has raised temperatures to the point that they are. We don't have to live like this. We don't have to live in an artificially austere economy. We have enough money. They're taking our money my money, your money, your money, your money, your money. They're taking our money and they're putting it into military projects that have nothing to do with us. The United States military is in like 150 countries right now. Countries most of us don't even know actually exist. Couldn't name them. And what are they doing? Oh, they're defending democracy. Oh, are they? Are they defending democracy? Because I don't feel very safe. I don't know about you, but last time I checked, there's about 300,000 dead, according to official roles. It's probably over 400,000 if you listen to some people. It's not right. It's bullshit. So you start pulling back from that. We don't need that many military bases. We don't need military hegemony. You start investing in human projects, infrastructure, education, insurance. You start putting money into those things, and all of a sudden the temperature goes down. The problem is that the wealthy and the powerful have abused their wealth and their power. That's it. They got too greedy, and they can't help it because that's what capitalism is. You know what's cooler than a million dollars? A billion dollars. You know what's cooler than a billion? A trillion. They can't stop. We have people in this country who have more money than whole countries. We have people in this country who are funding their own personal space programs. Elon Musk wants to uh, settle and colonize Mars in order to create his own libertarian kingdom away from the laws of man. Okay? Like, that's not okay. It doesn't have to be like this. You bring the temperature down by scaling back a little bit. You don't have, and by the way, I'm all for a major restructuring. Let's just be honest. Because that's where I, I'm going to be honest. I, I am pretty far left on this stuff. I think that we need a major reshuffling. I'm very far left and very progressive on this stuff. And I'm done, I'm done not talking about it. I'm very far left on this thing. But you don't even need to go as far as I want to go. You don't even need to do all that stuff. You can just dial it back a little bit to the point where it's like decimal points that most of these assholes would never notice an Elon or a Bezos. They would never even notice it. Yes. Dial it back a little bit. And all of a sudden temperature would just come down a little bit. That's all. It would fix this country. The problem is this austerity that the rich and the powerful have created because they don't give a shit about us. They don't give a shit about America. They don't believe in nations. They're not paying taxes. They're not doing anything. So that's how you do it. That's how you start to fix it. Start doing that, and then you start doing better things. But all of this polarization, all this anger, all of this growing fascism is a symptom of that project of wealth and power being turned up too much. 
it's turned up too much and they can't help themselves and they will destroy and they don't care about the planet absolutely it'll destroy this planet but and 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 by the way this economy that we're talking about it's not stable it's going to it's going to crash cuz I'll tell you what history tells you it always crashes it doesn't work because they just they if you don't have brakes on there you don't have regulations on it they crash it every time and do you know what suckers like me and you end up holding the bag like a bunch of assholes and then they they get bailed out get in make as much money get out right before it crashes then get helped if it crashes on you that's what they do it doesn't have to be like that horseshit and the fascist act is the muscle that's exactly right we're not the sheep. We're treated like sheep. We're better than that. We can be better, and we deserve better. It's bullshit. Tip your barista. Used to be a barista. That was one of my college jobs. I like making the coffee. <clears throat> um, that was enjoyable. Making the coffee was nice. Talking to people, going back and forth. This, that, that, that wasn't the worst job I ever had. I was a barista. I was a bartender. Decent jobs. Worst job I ever had was probably Lowe's. Lowe's and Walmart, the two big box stores. I was a cashier in both places. Lowe's was worse because all the contractors came in with a bunch of nails and screws, and they never had like something to scan. You had to find the numbers for them. Sucked. Sucked. Walmart just sucked because it was awful. And it took over my town, and then I had to go in and punch the clock and, and sit there. It sucked. Walmart sucked. Yeah, I worked at Walmart, wore the damn vest and all of that stuff. I was talking about this the other day. They had one of those, um, it was before satellite radio. And, um, oh, I'll answer that in a second, Aaron. So instead of satellite radio, Walmart had like a, I don't know, like a CD or a cassette that would play with music in the store. And it would replay the same song like once every half hour. So Edwin McCain's I'll Be on one of my ships, I would hear it. 16, 18, 20 times. I can't listen to that song. Oh, just makes me feel like I'm 16 and miserable again. Awful. Aaron, the economy crashing is going to look like this. It's in particularly in the way that we're situated right now. Um, no, not Coffee Grounds. There's a place called Coffee Break. It's a place called Coffee Break. And the people who owned the coffee shop, they were really into jazz. They actually opened the coffee shop so that they could perform jazz in the performance space. It was in Terre Haute, Indiana. What's up, ISU? I don't know if any second wars are watching this. I don't know. Oh, no, Walmart. Walmart is McDonald's with cheap shit, but I'll tell you something cool about working with Walmart. I had a couple of buddies who worked in the McDonald's and Walmart. I'm sure you remember that. Like, there used to be the McDonald's and the Walmart. And I would go, it was called I'll Be by Edwin McCain. Oh my God, all the time. And so I would go back to visit them in the McDonald's Walmart, which by the way, I should have known back then that America was in trouble when you had McDonald's and Walmarts. And I would go back there and if their boss wasn't around, they would let me come into the kitchen and make my own cheeseburgers in McDonald's. That was that was that was one of the benefits of the job. That was that was pretty cool. I enjoyed that making my own cheeseburger in the back of McDonald's. That was cool. I mean, I broke all kinds of regulations, but that was pretty cool. Yeah, that was that was not bad. That was pretty bad. Oh yes, actually, the economy crashing. So, what we're probably looking at, and this is one of the reasons um, that you now have this talk of getting rid of about ten thousand dollars in student debt. There's all these bubbles and there's all of these um, areas where Americans need to spend so much money. Uh, like you, you, you know, you have to buy, you got to buy cars, you got to buy insurance, you got to buy houses. And houses is one of those that's like really a, a, a really sort of volatile thing, particularly in this, in this moment. So like, for instance, uh, I'm lucky enough that I own a home, right? Like I, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. I have a tenured job. I, I, you know, there's only like a couple of hundred of like tenure track jobs in my field. Okay. But I also, I'm carrying around massive amounts of student debt. 
right? I'm, I'm a poor person. I grew up in a poor family. I had no money. I had to take out loans to go to school. Now, I was able to buy a house, but I'm still suffering through student debt. There are tons of people like me who were not able to get that tenure job, who are absolutely paralyzed by student debt. And that stuff keeps people from buying houses. It keeps people from investing in the economy. My generation, and I assume some of the people um, who are in this chat right now, like if I get money, I put it in my pocket. I don't invest it. I'm not out buying stocks. I'm not out doing this. I'm not out buying nice trucks or nice cars or whatever. What I'm doing is I'm making sure that I have it and that I'm, I'm building up money. I don't, I don't spend it. And it's created in this generation, a group of people who are not putting money into the stuff like houses and the economy. We're just not. And so, and, and they're going to do the thing like forgive $10,000 worth of student debt. It's not going to help. On top of that, capitalism, I can't believe we're talking about this tonight. Capitalism requires constant growth, constant growth. And again, I keep saying this, this is why a place like McDonald's is in, trust and in trouble every now and then. I'm sure you've seen these articles. They're like, McDonald's is having trouble right now. And you're like, what do you mean? McDonald's rules the world. Well, it doesn't matter if you are the biggest business in the world. This year, has to be better than last year. And next year has to be better than this year. Capitalism has to grow. It, it, it And it never stops. Every business has to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And if it falters, it's done. Well, we're reaching a saturation point to the point where it, it, it doesn't work anymore. Okay? Like, we're reaching a point where, and, and what ends up happening, and this is one of the things that I've had to start to wrap my head around is if you can't grow anymore, you have to find new places to grow. You have to take over new markets. You have to make inroads in new places. Well, you know, because at the end of history and global capitalism, there's not going to be much more growing. And I have to tell you, and this is really upsetting and it's something to put in the back of your head and think about a lot. Empires collapse when expansion is no longer possible. Exactly. Think about what happens when you're not growing anymore, but all of a sudden global climate change makes sure that the country starts shrinking. And something that I've learned in my research right now on the new book is this. If your country is fighting and everybody's like really tense and there's a bunch of polarization, you either fix it by giving people better lives or you coalesce them and you direct them at an enemy on the outside. This is why wars happen in times of crisis. This is why you have the war, uh, World War II, the last major war, is you have a country in Germany that's losing power and constricting, and there's a bunch of internal frictions, and then all of a sudden, you have to grow. You have to go out and you have to fight other people and take over stuff. It should make you anxious, but I have to tell you that when you start to understand this, it's not just coming all the time. It's not just coming completely out of nowhere. You have the beginnings of an understanding. When you have the information and you understand how it happens, it's not just like, you know, a monster in the darkness. It's something that you can start to see coming. It's something you can start to feel. And right now what people are talking about is the fact that America's economy is in trouble. And particularly with the pandemic and everything around it and inequality, that's the other thing. The inequality is out of control. Who's going to buy their products? That's what happens is the rich and the powerful rig the system and they're like, ah, we're going to have all the money. Don't worry about it. And then all of a sudden someone knocks on their door. Sir, no one's buying our stuff. Well, why are they buying our stuff? It's like, well, they don't have any money. So you have choices, which is you either go out and you start a war and you find other resources and other markets or you crunch down on individual rights and labor rights. And all of a sudden, like, minimum wage isn't there anymore. All of a sudden, children are in factories. All of a sudden, you don't have jobs with health care. You have a gig economy. Yeah, this is what we're facing. We're looking at, we're looking at the shaking of a, of a snow globe and everything changing. Like, we are on a really dangerous precipice. Doesn't have to happen. We can take preemptive action. We can take preemptive action and it can be better. But we need to recognize the problem.
Tip your barista. Again, I got off on barista because I was a, a barista for a minute. Biden referenced Charlottes Charlottesville in that leaked recording. It felt odd in the light of massive number of cars driving into protester attacks. Are people unaware of the massive increase of domestic terrorism against protesters? Absolutely, they are. Nobody's paying attention to that stuff, and it's happening constantly. People are being killed. People are being stabbed. People are being beaten and shot. It's happening all over the place. People don't want to look at it. And that goes back to what I'm saying. They'd much rather stick their head in the sand and not think about it anymore. It's awful. We have a large, large thing. I'm going to talk about Steve Schmidt and AOC here in a second. But yeah, this happens all the time. There is growing fascism in this country. People don't want to talk about it. Which, by the way, I'm going to call out a name. Nate Silver can go to hell. Just get out, man. This guy who sits around and crunches numbers and is wrong about everything all the time. He was right about one election. Now all of a sudden he's treated like he's some sort of prophet or something. He's like, there's nothing to worry about. Everything's fine. Oh, is it? Is it? You want to call up the families of people who are getting killed and beaten? Like, you want to do that? And I know that it's great when you're being paid like six figures to be wrong about every damn thing. God, these people are so exhausted. I had a moment, God, what, a week ago? It was like Matt and Matt Iglesias. And I was just like, he was being a moron. He's such an obtuse ass, a privileged ass. And I was like, I'm ready to go rounds with this guy. And then I was like, I can't. I got to stop. I got to move away. Not worth my time. Because there's not a tweet that you're ever going to send anybody and someone's going to go, aha, you're right. You've just changed my entire philosophy because that's not what Twitter is for. Twitter is technically for commodifying your outrage and selling it as a product. We can use it for informational purposes and we can use it for organization purposes. And I've worked on it and you've worked on it to create community through Twitter. But Twitter is not for that. Twitter is about making people fight and commodifying their fighting. That's all it's about. So I was like, I have to move away. I can't fight with you anymore. And I would argue, and this is a thing that, that I hope you feel and maybe maybe helps you. If you feel like fighting with somebody on Twitter, go and do something constructive. Because you're not going to win them over. It's just a commodification of friction between people and a commodification of outrage. That's all it is. We can use it for organization, educational purposes, and community purposes. But we have to be very careful about how we do it. Have to be very, very careful. Ken says, why is there no way for us to go around Republicans and stop this nonsense dead in its tracks? The founders didn't seem to account for the Senate executive branch. Absolutely. Founders screwed up, man. They had no actual imagination. They were like, ah, you know, there's not going to be factionalism or political parties. It didn't last 12 years. It didn't last 12 years before they had political parties and the entire system started falling apart. They were just wrong. They had a lack of imagination. They thought... The founders thought that white, wealthy men were just going to agree on things. Like, you know, whatever helps us, helps us, and we'll just move forward. I keep saying this. Everyone who says that the founders would roll over in their graves about Trump, no, they wouldn't. They'd be like, oh, you have a billionaire white man in charge? Wonderful. I bet things are going really well. Why? Because they didn't have a lot of political imagination. The only thing that they had an imagination for and this is an important thing to remember about America and about politics in general. In the 18th century with the Enlightenment, we're always told that it's a revolution for liberty, freedom, and equality. That's not what it was. It was a bourgeois movement. It was taking the king out of the equation so there was an, aristoc uh, an aristocratic rule and then everybody else. That's what it was. They, it didn't just go straight to the people. That's what they sold it to us as. But that's not what it was. Not what it was. It's a completely confounded thing. These revolutions always get sold to us as if they are for the people. They get the people involved. They have the people go out and fight. They have the people sacrifice their lives. And they'll, they'll, they'll pay lip service to the people. But it's always about making sure that the rich and the powerful take over from other rich and powerful people. That's what happened in America. And we need to recognize that that's what actually happened. Who is the best founding father, in your opinion? Probably Ben Franklin, maybe? I don't know. Thomas Jefferson, when he wasn't being a complete racist, slave-holding ass? It's really rough. It's really rough to choose a best one. I don't really hold them up as heroes. I've stopped holding up political... Um, I've stopped holding up political figures as heroes. 
Some of them do good things. Others don't do great things. You got to gotta do that. The world is not about heroes and villains, unfortunately. All right, here we are at an hour. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. I'm so grateful for you all. 7, or 3, 2, 1. Cheers. No, fuck James Madison. James Madison sucked. James Madison was a slave-holding aristocratic ass who created the system the way that he did because he didn't trust normal people. Sadly. Sadly true. James Madison sucked. Madison sucked. Hamilton sucked. Most of them sucked. Carl Tyson. Thoughts on anti-Trump protesters engaging with pro-Trump marchers? I don't know. I don't know what to tell you about that. I always feel weird. Oh, God, Woodrow Wilson sucked. One of the worst human beings told the office of president. Awful. One of these days, I'm, I, I'm the next American Rule lecture, which I'm probably going to do after the um, after the new year. I got to write a script. Um, we got to do the audio documentary for the Muckrake podcast, which, by the way, is going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. I'm so pumped about the uh, audio documentary for the Muckrake Um I just finished the second chapter of the new book and I got to get the materials for the other one. So my guess is the next installment of the American rule lectures is going to be probably early January. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about Wilson in that one. Wilson sucked. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know what to say in terms of prescriptive behavior in terms of whether or not these people should be engaging with proud boys in the streets. Like, I don't know what to say about that. I don't know to tell Antifa people that they shouldn't be fighting with these people because I have to tell you, is it from the Proud Boys skirt collection? Uh, uh, Touche. I think you fight fascist, and I don't know what else to say. They shouldn't be allowed to roam the streets. Law enforcement sure as hell isn't going to take care of them, although they did start fighting back against them last night. I don't know. I don't know what they should do. I don't know if you should be out in the streets fighting them. I don't know if that just makes things worse. But I do have to tell you that in history, watching the fascist fought against by anti-fascist, it seems like it played a crucial role in the entire thing. I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know how to deal with it. Ricker, not even sure how to ask this question. I don't know how to answer half of them. Tomorrow, the Electoral College will certify election results. On January 6th or 7th, Congress and VP Pence will confirm those results. What fuckery can the seditionist attempt between now and then? Also, should Pelosi refuse to seat GOP in the House? Well, first and foremost, she's not going to refuse to seat GOP in the House. So just we got to take that off the table. That's not going to happen. Uh, the Democrats will appease and appease and appease. That's just the way it is. Um, what can they do? I mean... Trump wants to Trump wants to get out of the White House and go into his post presidency pretending to be the president in exile. That's what he wants. Um, but if somebody starts, I don't know, busting into chambers and carrying out violence, and all of a sudden they're like, Are you like going to be the leader of this movement? I don't know. I don't know. I I I don't know what would happen at that point. I I Violence doesn't sound like crazy. Doesn't sound crazy. I mean, Antifa, Antifa, Antifa. I, I'm from Greene County, Indiana. I'm lucky I can walk around on two legs, man. I, I, I'm i lucky I can pronounce any words. Half the time of my vocabulary, I haven't said anything like I haven't, I haven't used half the words that I've used in writing out loud. So I'm happy I can go online and do this thing. Antifa, Antifa. All right. Uh, okay, I have a couple of questions here uh, that are engaged uh, about the idea of secession, which actually we need to talk about it. Um, okay, three questions. I'll read them all at once. Fight the power. Would secession really be that bad? 
Julia says, uh, can you speak to progressives like myself living in red states who can't leave for financial and familiar reasons, having to deal with hearing people say, yeah, let them secede. I feel very lumped into a category by certain coastal elites. Jack Flower said, how should muckrakers living in red states prepare to keep our loved ones safe, especially if movements towards secession become further organized? If you start embracing the idea of secession, you are adding into a really volatile situation. You're not going to get to a place where they just live over here in peace and you live over here in peace. On top of that, every quote unquote red state is populated with people like myself or people like Julia, people who do not agree with this stuff, people who are not on board with this stuff. On top of that, you have a bunch of people who are vulnerable populations. These white supremacists come from a long tradition of exploiting those people, using them in slavery, intimidating them, keeping them down via the law. It's not going to be good. And the idea that you should cede any ground of these people is insane. This country does not need secession. This country needs to change. Oh, it's blue. Georgia is blue, but I'm telling you, it's it, it won't it won't look blue if there's a secession movement. I'll just say that. It's not good. It's really, really bad. The idea that there would be this part of the country that is set aside for these people and this set aside for other people, it's crazy. And on top of that, do you think and Russia wants secession in the US? Absolutely. Do you think that they're just going to accept their boundaries? You think they'll be peaceful? No, that's not how this stuff works. When you actually look at their philosophy, it's all about expansion and domination. They want secession and they want two different countries so they can make war and behave towards others under the duress of war as opposed to doing this in polite society and, I don't know, going to Kenosha and shooting three people. They're not peaceful, all right? Secession's not going to happen. First and foremost, second of all, all of the talk is meant to promote the idea of violence. That's all it is. It would be bad for everyone. Everyone. This secession thing needs to go away, period. People in red states, we need to form our own organizations, grassroots connections, because there's more of us than them, period. There's more of us than them. YRK Jones says, if the GOP continues to descend into fascism, I think Democrats need to find a way to economically separate from the GOP. Blue state taxes to register Democrats in red states, and would Democrats are those on the left? Oh, why did it move? Jumped on me. Jumped on me. Uh, and would Democrats on the left living in red states? Your thoughts and objections. I don't think that works. I think we have to stop creating divisions, and we have to figure out a way to lower... Oh, yeah, water's being traded. I'll talk about that in a second. I think we need to lower the the radicalization and the tensions. I don't think by focusing on punishing other people that's going to help anything. I think here's the problem. The idea that government can't help people or can't make life better has created a situation where we believe that winning the presidency or winning in politics means making the lives of our enemies worse and not our own lives better. We can have a politics that makes life better for everybody. I think that's what we need to focus on. And this is one of those things. And I keep talking about this thing where it's like economic programs that might de-radicalize people in middle America. People are like, why help them? They lost the election. We have to get beyond that. We have to get beyond zero-sum politics. Because I have to tell you, the people in this country who have it the worst, they're not just isolated. They're not just suffering on a street somewhere. Their condition affects your condition. We have to push the idea that we are all in this together and that by making one life better, you can make all the lives better. So I don't believe in punitive politics. Um, the idea that they're trading water should just terrify everybody. But it's true. There are tons of people. Oh God, that's that's one thing. I'm glad Victor brought, up, brought that up. Nuclear weapons make secession impossible. I mean, we're looking at a future. If anybody, by the way, pays attention to the breakup of the Soviet Union, then maybe you should do that tonight after we're done with this thing. Go and look up nuclear weapons in the fall of the Soviet Union. See how that turned out. Wasn't great. Wasn't great. Wasn't great. It was weird. It was weird and very, very tense for a hot minute. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, but the trading of water, people are going to make money off the destruction of this planet and the chaos to come. That's just it. I'm feeling great. I'm not buzzing from the bourbon. It takes a lot more than that to make me buzz. Have you not watched the bourbon talks? I'm fine by this time. L West, here we go. People have been asking. What's your take on the Lincoln Project reaching out respectfully for a dialogue with AOC? Here we go. The Lincoln Project is a right-wing project to reestablish power in a post-Trump world. They have raised God knows how much money for themselves. I want to say it's like $60, $70 million, something along those lines, um, you know, to create their own media situation. They didn't change anybody's minds. They made ads that liberals loved and shared on social media because they hit that, um, that visceral part of us, the reptilian part of the brain, right? And it's the old ads that created our modern GOP. That's the thing that everyone loses, is that these are the people who got us to where we are. But they started making ads that attacked our enemy, and we're like, yeah, absolutely, go get them. We cannot let them off the hook for what they've done. I do not trust anything that the Lincoln Project or anyone associated with the Lincoln Project does until they prove themselves beyond a shadow of a doubt. So everything that they do, I enter in with just a little bit of a, hmm, I'll wait and see. Them reaching out to Ocasio-Cortez seems like the right um, um, optic, right? Which they're very good at. That's what they understand. They understand optics and reptilian brain politics. Uh, you know, they want to talk to AOC, go talk to her. But I guarantee that they're not going to find some sort of common ground. And I'll also say, and this is important because I, I, I want people to know this. I'm not biased. I'll call bullshit when I say bullshit. AOC has been really impressive in how she's gone after all these people, how she's presented herself, how she's talked about politics, how she's presented an alternative vision for the future. This conversation with, if she goes and talks to uh, the Lincoln Project guys, that's going to show us a lot about who she is. Because this will be one of the first moments where she has an opportunity to gain power by doing something against her principles. I don't think she'll go for it. I think she's a, I think she's a, a like a legitimate, authentic person. Uh, it'll tell us a lot about who she is and what she thinks about and what she values. So go talk to him. But everything that the Lincoln Project does, I'm just going to be like, hmm, hmm, let's wait and see. But I don't think they did anything in 2020. I don't think they did anything besides make a ton of money, period. I, yeah, I don't think she'll go for it either. I think she'll go talk to him. I think she's a reasonable person. But we also do not need to do the thing because this is a big thing. And I keep talking about this too. I'm glad we're talking about it now. We need to move beyond symbolic politics, symbolic victories and, and promoting ourselves in an economic manner in terms of our politics. The Lincoln Project people have made a ton of money and gained a ton of cultural and political value because they allow people to express their, their political ideas. So I, 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 I want to see where they go, what they do. I want a lot of apologies from the Lincoln Project people. I want them going out and talking about everything and saying, this is what we did. This is the problem. These are the mistakes that we've made. Here's what we believe. Here's what we've learned. I would love that. I don't think they're going to do that, but I would love that. But we cannot just accept them in general and pretend like they didn't do what they did and that they aren't who they are. And if they want to come around and tell the Democratic Party or liberals or, or progressives what to do or what direction to take, they can go pound sand and they can go to hell. Period. And they're all over mainstream media because mainstream media likes to talk about how rational these people are. And can you believe these people over here? The Trumpist. It's madness. You cannot just accept these people out of hand. Don Wagner, how do we get regular people to understand what's going on? That's the $64,000 question. I don't know if you can speak truth and facts to Trumpist. I don't know that you can do that. It's a trench warfare situation. The battle lines are drawn. If you come in speaking political talking points, they're done. They're done. They're, they're out. They're not going to participate in a conversation. We need to repair atomized 
alienated society. We need to talk to people. We need to rebuild trust. We need to have conversations that aren't about politics that then lead into politics. The thing, material conditions, exactly. I'm so glad Kelly said that. That's exactly what it's about. We cannot address the alternate reality that they live in. It's, it's impenetrable. You cannot just say, your facts are wrong and my facts are better. Listen to me. That's done. Trump has gotten rid of that. Newt Gingrich before him got rid of that. And Rush Limbaugh helped out with that whole damn thing. What we have to do is repair trust. And we have to de-radicalize them coming in the back door. Oh, a lot of wealthy people are all in on Trumpism. It's a wonderful tool for them. We make their conditions better. We start to make them believe that government can help them and that the Democratic Party is not their enemy. They're not the deep state, you know, drinking adrenochrome in some cave somewhere. We can reach people. And once we start, and this is an important thing. When I'm able to reach people, and I've had some success, it's because we don't have a conversation about Democrats and Republicans. We don't have a conversation about Biden, Trump, Clinton, Obama, any of these people. We have a conversation about the divide between wealthy people and poor people and how wealthy people use all of their power and all of their resources to keep poor people down. And when you start having conversations about that, all of a sudden they're not talking those old talking points. And if you talk to them and you, you gain trust that way, they'll tell you they're like, I agree with that, that it's the racism, bigotry, and xenophobia they cling to. I don't think you're going to get rid of it. I really don't. I think the only way that you can actually get racism and bigotry and xenophobia out of these people is to make them believe that there is an economic incentive for them. That, that, that continuing to cling to racism, bigotry, and xenophobia, that it hurts their earning power. Because you can't go in, like, and, and, and again... I love the people I grew up with. I love the people in my family. I love the people around me. But you're not going to be able to go in and tell them you're being racist. You have to stop being racist. You have to give them economic incentives to not do that stuff. And it sucks. I don't know how to just make them care about other people. But if you give them a personal reason, maybe they will start caring about other people. One of the things that has happened, and this is an important thing to keep in mind about this country, is there is a massive divide between people in this country who went to college and people in this country who didn't go to college. When you go to college, not only do you get informed and in all of this propaganda that you're fed in this place, that does it get like fed into you and washed away, but you also get taught how to engage in modern progressive liberal society. You can't say slurs, you can't use stereotypes, you can't you know, harass people, you can't do that type of stuff. If you do that, your life is over. Over here, they sort of cling to that as like class denotations. They kind of, yeah, it depends on what college you went to, no shit. They kind of cling to that stuff as sort of like a class marker of who they are and their identities, you know? There's a reason why these people are like roaming around with truck nuts on the back of their, you know, massive, massive trucks. So I don't think you can go in and tell them that they're doing this stuff because they retract from that and suddenly they think you're trying to get one over on them or, you know, preach to them. There's a reason why the people I, you know, know and grew up around, they'll always say, I'm not racist, but they understand that they can't say the thing, but they want to go ahead and say it and make it their cultural marker. I think you deal with the material conditions and the, and the, and the temperature will go down and they, maybe they'll become less de-radicalized and maybe they'll move away from the more racist xenophobia stuff. Doesn't mean that they will, but it means maybe they'll stop shooting people in the streets. Yeah, call it college. I agree. Okay, Melissa, you've mentioned you're working on a book about the history of Western civilization. Any takeaways so far? Okay, first things first is that these things go in cycles constantly. Um, I know that that's. <sighs> I know this maybe is like little comfort, but maybe it should be a lot of comfort, which is that there are these moments. I mean, you know, I just got done with the Middle Ages. After the fall of Rome, the church controlled all information and learning, and most of the populace was completely illiterate and, you know, was was lorded over by the church. And, you know, you had like inquisitions, you had like people being slaughtered left and right, awful stuff. Humanity found a way. 
they educated themselves. They, they came together. They fought against it. They found a little bit of power and they started to change things. History is not static. That's one of the major things. The second thing is that we just have all these stories. We have all these stories that just keep us hidden in illusions and away from understanding what's actually happening. And it's a really, really, pro it's, a, it's a huge problem. Uh, number three, I would say, is that, um, well, it goes back to what I was saying before, is that internal frictions are pushed outwards and they lead to wars and big giant crises. I think that's an important thing to remember, particularly in the situation we're in now with massive crises. Jack Burden, tonight's question is, holy shit, have you seen this deranged Crenshaw video? Yeah, uh, Crenshaw's trying really hard to be a fascist leader and an up-and-comer within the Trumpist fascist realm. He doesn't have it. That's the thing about Crenshaw. He'll make a fine crony. Uh, he'll, he'll, he'll make like a good number two to whoever takes over the Trumpist fascist structure. But Crenshaw just doesn't have it. And he also sucks. This sucks. I can't believe SNL had him on and apologized to him and treated him like it was some sort of like civil discourse. That dude's like such a total asshole. That's absolutely right, Chris. I was just reading about that, writing about that. When the plague hit, the peasants were able to leverage their labor against other people. It's really incredible what happened, um, what happened with feudalism into capitalism. Really interesting. You had a bunch of uh, white Europeans who were being exploited. Then they rose up. There were small revolutions, and and all the wealthy and powerful were like, I don't know if we can exploit the white people anymore. We need to go to other countries and find people of color to exploit. Messed up. Real Ali G. Word is that Republican congressmen can still object to electors. I believe the argument that it probably wouldn't work, but given how many Republicans joined Texas lawsuit and refused to acknowledge Biden, do you think they will make a show of it for their base and create more chaos? Yeah. No, absolutely. And that's how this thing works. None of them expect to actually overturn the election. But if it just happens, it just happens, which is the really frightening thing that should worry everyone. It's that they there is a financial and political incentive to engage in this sedition. The fact that we live in a time where all of these people have incentives to behave this way, it's a problem. We that, that if you do this, you should be gone. You shouldn't be in politics anymore. You shouldn't be able to make money anymore. You should just be a pariah. The fact that we're at the point where that's the smart thing for you financially and politically, that's the problem. Okay, we got a couple more. Okay, Dr. Sarah Nathan, which is, of course, a reference to this whole Joseph Epstein thing, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. I have a question about that. Thoughts on meaningful, positive change over the next couple of years. I've heard a number of people say they expect things to not make any progress. I personally think some things will change and some things won't. I think that's an accurate prediction. I think people are going to get tired of this bullshit. And going back to the beginning of this conversation, I think the more that we build these communities and trust and solidarity, I think we can change things. I do. I think we've reached the point where we recognize the system doesn't work. And by the way, looking back on like Middle Ages and ancient history, I have to tell you that plagues, plagues expose problems and lead to change. This plague that we're dealing with now, this awful, awful tragedy, I think has made it very apparent the government doesn't care about us, corporations don't care about us, and we should change things and things need to get better. So I think things could get better. I think we're at a moment where things could get a whole lot better. I really, truly believe that. Catherine Parker. I'll definitely, I'll definitely tune in. Cheers. You mentioned some weeks ago, if we have a history. I think I know what you mean, but would love your thoughts. Yeah, so a couple things. One, human society can fall, period. We can have an apocalyptic situation. Like going back to what I was talking about with the fall of Rome. Rome falls, which is an apocalypse in the ancient ages, and all of a sudden, literacy completely goes down and the church takes over all information. One of the things you have to consider is the possibility that these fascist, authoritarians, corporatists, whoever, whatever, something could happen really, really bad. And suddenly information could be held by one singular source. So you don't even have history anymore. Or you have a history that is written by and for the interest of moneyed interest. That's bad. That's really, really bad. And I have to tell you, now that it's all digital and things can be changed and it's not even on a piece of paper, whew, that's scary. 
Broadway. All right, let's say Trump actually manages to steal this election. I don't think he will. What would that even look like? Violence. There'd be millions of people in the street, and the state would put us down through violence, but I think we'd win out. But the state would try. The state would try and maintain order and power, but I don't think it would work. Claire says, I want to get my Trump and Republican relatives American rule for Christmas, but do you think it would help? Okay, I'm going to make my sales pitch. I actually think American rule would help. And here's the reason why. Oh, yeah, no, 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 I did. I wrote about the sacking of the Library of Alexandria. Absolutely. That's in the book already. That's chapter one of the new book. That's in chapter one. Um, I, so here's my Christmas family pitch for American rule. I actually think American rule can make a difference with people. I've already heard from some people that their families and that their parents have b met the, the book American rule warmly and it's changed some opinions. I think, okay, so first off, American rule is not a partisan book. There's a lot of blame to go around. I mean, the Democratic Party under Woodrow Wilson and particularly during the Confederacy and Reconstruction sucked. And on top of that, I, I don't care very much for what the Democratic Party did post Reagan. That's neither here nor there. The Republican Party has had a lot of problems with all that stuff. and They've done a lot of wrong, particularly in the last 50 years. But the book is honest. I'm, I, I, and I hate to tell you this, I, and I hope that y'all are y'all are hanging out with me on a Sunday night. I hope you believe this. I hope I'm not just preaching to the choir. I'm not a partisan hack. I wrote a book that actually talks about what happened in this country. And it points out that the rich and the powerful have manipulated you and put you in a really bad situation. Here is what I would say if you want to buy your family American rule. Take the cover off. Take the flap off. I think it's a beautiful cover. I do. I think it's a beautiful cover. But the upside down flag might turn off somebody who might start reading the book and be into it. But it is a truthful diagnosis of what's going on. So it has the power of truth. That's the important thing I think about that book. So if you take the American flag cover off the book, I think you can give it to people and it'd be there. There is an audio book of American Rule. It's, uh, uh, man, what's the name of it? Uh, Carson McLeod. Beautiful voice. I wish I could have done it, but Carson McLeod. Oh, I think it's Carson McLeod, or it might be Carson Weathers. Somebody look that up if you get a chance. Beautiful voice. He also did Bad Blood, which was a wonderful audiobook. Anyway, American Rule. I think makes a good Christmas present, even for the people in your life who are, quote unquote, right wing or Trumpist, because it tells the truth. It talks about how we got there. Ah, my Indiana draw, my Southern Indiana twang. But anyway, take the cover off, give it to him. I think it'll, I think it'll work. I think American rule works as a gift for uh, people like that. Yeah. You put your stamp flags upside down, your flag stamps. That is provocative. Woo. McLeod Andrews. There it is. Beautiful voice. Nice guy too. Susan, what do you think about this Dr. Biden bullshit? <laughs> well, first of all, it's all bullshit. Second of all, the dude who wrote that article in uh, the Wall Street Journal, just a total asshole. Homophobe, wrote a bunch of really disgusting articles for a while. I have no idea why the Wall Street Journal ran that thing. Besides, it was provocative and it got hate shared online, which is something, by the way, we have to do. We have to stop hate sharing articles. Because these places run stuff that they know is offensive and awful, but they'll put it out there because it will drive up hits because we hate share. Now, this whole thing, and this is this is something that's really stupid, but it's true. What happened in the Wall Street Journal with this article about Jill Biden, it wasn't just misogynist. It was academic infighting spilling out into the public sphere. What you have to understand about academics is we are in a state of austerity too. So we fight constantly. We fight so much amongst ourselves. So for instance, I'm a professor. I'm a liberal arts professor. I got an MFA, which is the terminal degree in my field, right? It's a PhD equivalent. But PhDs 
talk shit about MFAs and MFAs talk shit about PhDs. What he did was he went after her and he had professional jealousy of her because he had never had like a tenured position. His, his career had been a total and utter failure. He is an absolutely unremarkable white academic who like got every break possible, but he, he, he was totally like perceived uh, aggression. Yeah. It was, it was academic bullshit spilling into the sphere and shame on the wall street journal for writing that. My God, that was stupid. Oh, Oh, Alex, assuming Warnick and Ossip make it to the Senate, what's the concern that more conservative Democrats will break up the Democratic majority? Two words, Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin sucks. Joe Manchin really sucks. And Joe Manchin's having a wonderful Christmas, I have to tell you. He is just ready to go. He has tucked the napkin into his shirt. If the Democrats don't win the Senate, chances are he'll probably go ahead and caucus with the Republicans. He's not worried about it. If Warnick and Ossoff both win, all of a sudden he basically holds the keys to the kingdom for whatever the Democrats want to do. They have to go through Joe Manchin. So you'll see a ton of money go to West Virginia and you'll see every progressive policy watered down because Joe Manchin's an asshole. That's what it is. And if you want, and by the way, Manchin needs to go. The problem is that progressives need to go ahead and organize and take over the party and be more aggressive and then you don't have to worry about Joe Manchin. Yeah, Joe Lieberman. Ugh. Few people did more to defeat universal health care in this country than Joe Lieberman. Joe Lieberman and Will Crystal, those two guys. Cheers, everyone, as like 400,000 people have died of coronavirus. <sighs> Dialectical diatema. How do we dif differentiate between incompetence from malevolence? You can't, particularly with Trump. Those two things go hand in hand. Yeah, neoliberalism is a big problem in all of this. Which, by the way, neoliberalism is a problem in terms of the term because it makes everyone think it's just liberal. It's not just liberal. Neoliberalism is something that was cooked up with Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, but also you saw the Democratic Party start to fold up within it when an entire class of technocrats who want to run the country as a business. Sucks. Sucks. Can be better. Can be so much better. Last two. <sighs> Ice Wizard. That's a hell of a name. Ice Wizard. We talk about the fucked up marriage between Christianity and Trump sometime. Well, I talk about it all the time, but uh, it's absolutely incredibly dangerous and powerful. Uh, the evangelical right in this country is a neo-Confederate group that believes in power and wealth, and that's all. Um, the entire relationship is that they have use Donald Trump as a divine agent to push their agenda. And, you know, it's all in the pursuit of wealth and power, which is what they care about. Um, they worship him as a Messiah. And again, going back to, um, going back to the research I've been doing, going into past history, you know, it's Constantine and Charlemagne. These are two people who like just massacred people left and right and they weren't godly at all, but the church was like, these are our guys. We love them. That's what they see in Trump. And they treat him like a messiah because he stands up there and he fights their enemies. So they worship him as a faulty messiah. Uh, if you haven't read already, my article about the cult of the Shining City is on New Republic. Just Google it. The cult of the Shining City uh, embraces the plague, I think is the title. Uh, I've talked a, a lot about this uh, in my writing and on the podcast and stuff like that. Big, giant, weird uh, interrelationship between the evangelical right, a white supremacist neo-Confederate movement, and uh, power and wealth in this country. Really, really weird. Okay, last question. Zachary Tinney says, what advice would you give to someone who wants to do what you do? Write about and cover politics. It's difficult to keep up with everything, stay current, and provide timely analysis and commentary. So first and foremost, to do what I did, and, and for those who don't know it, I hope you indulge me for a second. Um, I was just a dude who needed something to do. I had this failed novel uh, back in 2015. It was called We Build the Future. It was pretty good. It, it, it was failed. It wasn't going to work out. Maybe I'll revisit it sometime in the future. But uh, does anyone want to hear? I'll, I'll tell you what it was about. I missed you guys last week. I'm, I'm milking this thing for every minute that I can get. 
We Build the Future was a three uh, protagonist novel. One guy was a producer on an Alex Jones conspiracy podcast radio show. Uh, the second main character was the starting quarterback for the Houston Texans, who was having an identity crisis and believed that he had become uh, some sort of holy receptacle of God. And the third was a, um, a college student who was in a relationship with the conspiracy theory producer and was involved in a scandal at her small college. And then there was a... Um, there was a secret society of Luddites who were trying to destroy big tech and innovations, and he got caught in the middle of it. That was uh, We Make the Future. It was a good book, but it just uh, it got a little bit out of my control. And I was like, I need to go out and do something else. So I was going to spend a few months studying the uh, political race of 2016. I thought I'd go to a few rallies and publish like a small book. Yeah, it wasn't bad. Um, I went to a few rallies, reported on them, whatever, nobody paid attention. And then I started going to Trump rallies and I was like, listen, guys, there's some bad shit happening in here and here's what's happening. And, um, and, and all of a sudden I had a national voice. I don't know. I went into a rally in Greensboro, North Carolina with like 1100 followers. And I walked out with something like, 75 or 80,000 in my entire life changed. And all of a sudden it was like all the alt-right was coming after me. People were showing up in my driveway and trying to break into my house and I had to figure things out. I don't know. The whole point is I just went places and I got involved and I was in the right place at the right time. Don't get me wrong. I, I was in the right place at the right time. I am a white male who looks the way that I do. Trumpists talked to me. They told me what they believed. I was able to report what Trump Trumpists believed. Which, by the way, everyone's like, oh, there's no way the Trump people actually believe what you're saying. And it's like, well, here we go. Luckily, we've finally gotten to the point where people actually believe it and understand what's going on. More people need to, but that's neither here nor there. The whole point is I just got out there and talked about what was going on. I put some skin in the game. That's how I ended up here. I did not have the understanding that I do now when I started this thing. I started reporting on this stuff. And then after I reported on this stuff, I was like, man, I probably need to, I probably need to educate myself to understand how we got to this point. And so then I started doing the research and, and educating myself. The good news is that there are tons of books out there that explain to you how we've gotten to this point. You just have to read them. You have to, like, you know, I, I'm like anybody else. I watch TV. I watch movies. I play video games. Like, but I also make sure that, like, I spend a good amount of my time researching and educating myself. Um, if you do that, if you start educating yourself and consuming this stuff and starting to like connect the dots, this story is not hard. Like it's all there. And if you go out and like, I've had the good fortune of like talking to academics and historians and I'm like, Hey, this is what I'm finding. Is this right? And they're like, Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is right. And it's like, well, why aren't we talking about this? And they're like, well, no one cares about this. No one wants to talk about this. Academics are siloed. They're treated like nobody gives a shit about what they say. All this stuff is out there. You read the right books, you find the right articles, you'll understand things more and you'll be able to explain it to other people and you know have conversations with people. So I, I just went places. I got in my car and I drove hours to go to these rallies and you know I'd just go in places and um, talk to people and, and, and do the footwork. And it paid off for me, I was lucky. I, I, I think I was talented, I think I was the right person to explain it but I also think that I got lucky. I think that all those things sort of played into played into it. But if you want to do what I do, just get some skin in the game. Go to the places, do the research, connect the dots. I think that's how you do it. Um, all right, I'm going to finish this thing up here in a second. Uh, a couple of programming notes. We will be back next week for Bourbon Talk. Uh, God willing, nothing bad happens. Don't lose any more friends or whatever. I'm sorry I missed last week. I missed you guys a lot. It was really, really hard. Um, 
but I was really excited to come back tonight. Really, really was. Uh, Muckrake podcast will come out Tuesday and Friday this week. Nick and I have a lot to talk about. For those who are interested, uh, we started a really good like bonus podcast talking about it. It's a Wonderful Life, talking about socialism, uh, the middle class, all that good stuff. Um, if you want to unlock that, go over to patreon.com slash muckrake podcast. We're going to have a muckrake community Christmas party, 730 December 23rd. If you want to hang out with us, have a few drinks of Christmas cheer, you know, commiserate the holidays, all that good stuff. Um, again, patreon.com slash muckrake podcast. Um, I was lucky enough to go on the uh, Brian Koppelman podcast, uh, The Moment, who I've been a fan of his for a very long time. Very long time. Uh, that's coming out Tuesday. I think I'm on the Mind Shift podcast. That might be out today. I got to check that out. Um, yeah. With that being said, I, 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 again, I appreciate you. I'm very, very thankful for you. I think we, oh, that's Festivus. That's a hell of a point, Mike. That is Festivus. So we're having a Festivus night. Thank you. I had forgotten about that. It's a good point. But um, I appreciate you. Very, very thankful for you. I missed you last week. All of the kind words um, were so appreciated. It was rough. It was rough. Um, yeah, last one, last born in the wilderness. Yeah, it's on that too. But I appreciate all of you. We're going to do more to fix this thing. We're building a community right now, and that's important. I, I trust you guys. You trust me, I hope. Um, that's what this is about. It's repairing the atomization and alienation. Trust each other, looking after, looking after each other. That's like this thing with the, the, the muckrake community. I, I, I have a true and honest belief that if somebody in this community fell on hard times and needed other people, the people would be there to pick them up. That's a massive thing. That, like, like that's really hard to underestimate and undersell. Like that's massive. We have to trust each other. We have to be there for each other. And if we do that, we can start enacting change. And I am dedicating, I'm dedicating this coming year in these bourbon talks on the muckrake podcast in whatever i do whatever live streams whatever way i can use my medium i don't know i'm i'm going to build something and we're going to work for something we're not just going to diagnose this thing we're not just going to decry it and point it out and highlight it we're going to try and build something and we're going to fight this damn thing back and we're going to beat it we're going to beat it we truly honestly are i don't know what form that's going to take i don't know how we're going to make it happen but we're going to work at it okay Thank you for being here. As always, you're the best. Cheers to a good week and beating back fascism and a better, more human future. Cheers. All right, everyone. Be good.